Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to ARC's FYI podcast. My name is Yasin. I cover crypto at ARC alongside Frank. And today we have the pleasure of being joined by Kathleen and Arthur Brightman, the founders of the smart contracting black blockchain Tezos. Arthur, Kathleen, thanks for joining us. We're really excited for this conversation. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So why don't we just start with a quick background from both of you for our audience. Uh, what, what got you into crypto? What got you to found Tezos? A little bit of history uh, uh, would, would help there. For me, it was at the intersection of a lot of my centers of interest. I had an interest in the theory of money and banking. I uh, had an interest in the political project around uh, uh, Bitcoin, around individual sovereignty. But I also had a long-standing interest in computer science, uh, smart contracts, sorry, the, um, cryptography. And of course, you know, all, all, all this comes at the, uh, at the confluence in cryptocurrency. So really early on, I, uh, I, I got super passionate about, uh, about it. I would just add that, like Arthur saying that he's had an interest in money, but like he has notes from himself when he was seven talking about <laughs> how he wanted to work in finance and his interest in currencies and things like this. So um, I, I share no such, I guess, epic uh, confluence of, of of things. But I guess um, my my story is jokingly that I married into it. But um, Arthur tends to have a pretty obsessive personality, and I think one of our hobbies together is just getting into things um, intellectually. And I think 2013, 2014. And like I started working at a hedge fund um, and Arthur really was nonstop talking about Bitcoin. And uh, I started to take it pretty seriously because um, I had a three hour long commute. So that was the perk of that job was uh, was reading in, in, about Bitcoin for several hours a day and then discussing it with my husband for the two hours a day I was awake <laughs> at home. Um, and that's really what got me into it. Can you walk us through kind of how you started going down this crypto path? So you're interested in finance and you're, you know about Bitcoin. How do you decide to build your own blockchain rather than work on Bitcoin or another existing blockchain? Well, my first intuition or uh, I would say uh, impulse was to, uh, was to do something with Bitcoin. Uh, not work on Bitcoin itself, but like use it for something. Uh, and I got interested into, I, there's a few projects that I, uh, that I got interested into. Uh, I got involved in a uh, uh, in a simple white label exchange, but it was not a it was not a Bitcoin exchange for me. It was not an interesting idea to have a Bitcoin exchange because so what you can buy and sell Bitcoin. What else can you do? Uh, so it was a white label exchange that was supposed to power futures and that was supposed to do uh, pre a prediction markets, this sort of thing. And then I quickly got interested more in the nuts and bolts of things uh, and saying like, okay, so this Bitcoin thing is interesting. You know, working with it. What are some ideas around this space? Uh, I started reading uh, a lot of conversations on IRC, I started reading the Bitcoin wiki, all sort of uh, talks happening on forums. And I really got interested into the topics around consensus, uh, around privacy. And what fascinated me was how much better Bitcoin could become if all of these ideas were, you know, were, were put in place. It was just this explosion of research and ideas that were, that were coming through. And I think one of my biggest disappointments was it was after a real world crypto conference in uh, in New York where the zero cash paper was presented and it became clear that there was no interest from the developer community around around bitcoin to ever adopt it or a clear way to uh, to do it and i had started my journey by thinking you know bitcoin is it's not an algorithm it's not a software it's an it's a network it's a it's consensus around a ledger and the underlying uh, means of operation can always change 
to seeing that it would not change and it would basically not increase its throughput. It would not uh, include uh, ways for a transaction to not be broadcast publicly. It would not have the benefit of smart contracts. And that got me thinking, well, there's a good reason for that. And that reason is you want to protect yourself against uh, social attacks. You want to protect yourself against people pushing change that will benefit them as opposed to the, uh, to the whole network. You want to protect against political capture of it. So I got that. But I said, that's too bad. Like, how do you protect against political capture while at the same time allowing for innovation? And that's, a, that's a, the fundamental impetus behind Tezos. It's also probably important to put into context that this is like 2013, 2014. And, uh, you know, nowadays uh, people just launch L1 cryptos, um, you know, almost on a whim. But back then it was a little bit less obvious uh, why you would do that because it, it was just much, much harder uh, to do so. Um, or at least there was less interest in new tokens and things like that. So all it's to say, like, just in terms of table setting, you know, this is like when Lightcash and Zcash were proposed and then launched. Um, so it's it's worth noting that it was like kind of a novel, um, it, was, it was a novel thought to do a new L1. And that's really interesting. I'm always fascinated by that debate of, you know, assessing the different trade-offs between, let's say, the hyper-conservative approach that Bitcoin takes and its sort of uncompromising design choices to fulfill a, a you know a set of objectives, albeit extremely narrow, but but still sort of very kind of specific, uh, versus let's say the more progressive, feature-rich, let's think innovation first, blockchains. I'd be curious where, where you kind of stand in that spectrum, perhaps where, where Tezos fits in that spectrum. And I think, Kathleen, you bring up a, a really interesting point of you know, these were thoughts that were, you know, re- really started to brew in, in 2013, 2014. How, how exactly have you seen the, the narrative change over time? And where do you see sort of Tezos fit in that picture? Well, I, I'll just take the first bit of it because I know Arthur has um, obviously a richness of opinion on it. But um, I suppose the, I guess, typecasting, which I, I thought was a little bit unfair um, from people, incumbents in the cryptocurrency space when Tezos was proposed was like, oh, this is going to be so radical and it's going to be um, just kind of like the Calvin ball of, of, of cryptocurrencies wherein, you know, the rules are kind of changed by fiat. In fact, you know, because the, the governance model that the Tezos network launched with or pre- the prevailing Tezos launch, network launched with um, uh, is so conservative, it's, you know, both it, it upgrades a bunch, uh, you know, it's going on the 11th upgrade, all very drama free. But actually what the the standards to get you to an upgrade that's ratified by a supermajority of token holders is actually extraordinarily high. Um, and so it's, it's not centralized in the sense that like, you know, there's not just one person like announcing what the roadmap is going to be. It's really the community coming around every time that there's a proposal and, you know, voting to test it, then ratifying it. And then, you know, obviously um, accepting it in some form as, as, as a continued the canonical version of Tezos. So I think the typecasting was both unfair. And yet, you know, there's, there's a lot of centralized projects that have been um, extremely popular because you sort of have this figurehead, this roadmap that's spoon fed to you. And Tezos is kind of in an in-betweeny land where it's it's actually properly decentralized, um, but it's also radically conservative in some of its assumptions and some of the ways that it, it takes um, pe- you know people to participate in the network and have the network ratify and upgrade. Yeah, I agree with that. I think we, we, we are kind of down in the middle um, in terms of how conservative we are in the sense that we are low innovation, which not just, you know, about, we're not just all about ossification, but we are very, very careful uh, about letting innovation in and how it happens and having very decentralized procedures for, for doing it. And how things are evolved, I think by and large, a lot of the um, standards have fallen over time. And I think some standards that people have have fallen for good reasons and some have fallen for not good reasons. So it used to be, for example, that if you had a cryptocurrency, it was unthinkable for the cryptocurrency not to be uh, in a device set, in a diverse uh, set of, uh, of of holders, you wanted, of course, you wanted to have as many holders as possible, as wide of a uh, as wide of a spread as possible. And if you were going to launch a uh, a cryptocurrency, you, that, that that's what you should aim for. Nowadays, no one is shocked if ninety five percent of your supply is held by venture capitalists. And I think it's because there's been a bit of a divorce in people's mind with are these things, you know, money. Are these things really decentralized or are they just, you know, if I'm being generous, oh, no, it's different. It's a token to pay for computation or, hey, it's just a token I want to flip. So the standards here, I think, have 
loosen uh, for the worst. In the same way, you know, people now refer to these projects as entities. You know, it's like, oh, you work for X, you work for this. No, they're not entities. They're they're projects, and people are loose with this. And I, I think that's um, that's harmful. Where standards have become better, I think, is uh, people used to be very obsessed with some ideas around like fair launches, for example, that was a big thing in uh, uh, in, in cryptocurrency. And I think that's I I I don't think that's a uh, I don't think that's a good thing. I, I I do think you want to have a very very diverse set of holders. You want to have something that's balanced. But you know, I remember when Zcash, for example, had a 10%, you know, going to uh, to fund development efforts of the block reward. You know, it, it it got people completely up in arms against this, and that didn't make sense. People have relaxed around trusted setups for cryptography, which I think is a good thing because nowadays you can really do them with thousands of people. So it's not something that came out of uh, of like a real cost-benefit analysis. It's something that came out of a knee-jerk reaction, and I'm glad that people have become more okay with that. So, yeah, it's it's a mixed bag. Yeah, you, you walk through this kind of interesting trade-off of and a spectrum, I think, of uh, if we look at smart contract blockchains, you have like an Ethereum, which has off-chain governance and roadmap, and you know things like the merge take five years to get done to transition to proof of stake and everything is kind of coordinated off chain. And it's um, from the Ethereum community lovingly referred to as herding cats. <laughs> and then you have on the opposite end of the spectrum to kind of compete with the existing layer ones, you have venture capital money coming in and you have organizations that look more like companies than kind of decentralized networks. How, how did you come up with this idea of on-chain governance being this uh, perhaps middle ground? And how is that worked over time, uh, both uh, interested in positives and negatives. It's probably worth clarifying that there kind of were no VC backed, you know, highly centralized L1 launches. So it's, it's not so much a middle ground <laughs> um, as much as everyone just kind of like took the goalpost and put it right over there. I think that's a, mostly a fad um, because this stuff really works when the market is, is um, you know, kind of going up and everyone's like not really paying attention to the details. But the reason we believe in decentralization um, is because we want to be resilient to like when things go very poorly and when you've got like sort of gregarious figureheads and people kind of like pushing the button in one sense, that's centralization. That's, uh, you know, arguably what we should be trying to wean ourselves off of in, in this, you know, new algorithmic, uh, you know, algorithmically enabled, uh, you know, financial system. It's like, you know, either you think that this stuff has a philosophical underpinning or you don't. And if you do, then you should be leaning towards something that like really emboldens and it and enables decentralization. Um, and it all kind of looks a little bit fuzzy when everyone is talking about, you know, FOMO and pumping and dumping and things like this. But if you actually get into like the reason that this cryptocurrency project exists, it's really to build up resilience against um, the sort of gregarious like showmanship that we've seen, um, you know, in, in, in traditional um, uh, traditional markets and things like that. So I don't know. That's kind of my take on it. I know it's not a direct answer, but it's that's kind of what comes to mind. I think that's OK. One one follow up question is, do you think the marginal, say, hundred millionth or billionth user of a blockchain will have that philosophical or ideological slant to their preferences or will they care about? what's most convenient? I doubt they will, but I think it's more like an insurance policy <laughs> than, than, it is, uh, than it is kind of a, a rallying cry. Right. Decentralization isn't important until it suddenly is. I, you know, I, I think what's been interesting to see just in you know, the last few years is, is how the market has really shifted from those who are really call it philosophically or ideologically aligned with what these decentralized networks represented. And now it's much more of a, really a product of its own success. You have more eyes on the industry. Um, and now even, even the fact that, you know, I'm even calling it an industry is like sort of testament to what we're talking about. It is interesting that I, I almost think there's going to be a point where that marginal user who might end up choosing convenience over decentralization ends up you know, shooting themselves in the foot. And then we ultimately sort of see a massive uh, shift back to the ethos of, of the early days. Uh, the question just becomes like, w when is that going to be? Or what, what is it going to take for us to see that shift back? 
one of Arthur's mantras is like, not everything has to be a trade off. So I, I, don't, I don't think they necessarily are like, they're, you know, it's convenient or it's decentralized. I think the two can go hand in hand. And in fact, what we've seen with like some of the corporates that choose Tezos as, as sort of a blockchain for whatever operations or whatever, um, you know, initiative they're taking on. One of the things they like is that it's, it doesn't rest on the the shoulders of one person or one entity and in some ways that makes it more reliable and more convenient for them to plan around it because you've got this very conservative approach to ratification um for any upgrade and that actually kind of strengthens the the case for, so that it's not going to run away and be at the helm or, or the uh risk of something else so in some ways it's more centralized and then the tooling on top of it i mean like we get a lot of compliments, at least I do, about, uh, you know, sort of the ease of use and things like this. And again, I think that's because it's not one company that's directing it, um, telling you that this is how it is. It's really just a, a plethora of, of different folks coming to the table um, from across the world, really, who have different perspectives and attitudes. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, the richness of diversity. So what is the, the current state of Tezos right now? I think, you, Arthur, you mentioned things around fair launches, uh, Kathleen. Uh, measurements of decentralization. Can you talk about a little bit about, about the state of the network? Yeah. So the network has been running live since 2018. So it uh, it passed this summer. It's fourth uh, it's fourth birthday. We were uh, it's been running in proof of stake for uh, since launch basically. Also, we did change the uh, consensus algorithm twice. So um, it started out uh, with an algorithm called Emmy, and then uh, became Emmy Plus. And recently, we had a, uh, there was a big overhaul of the uh, uh, algorithm in, in proposal I. So their name after cities. So it was uh, Ithaca, and in Ithaca, uh, the consensus was replaced with Standard Bake, which is inspired by the Tendermint uh, consensus method. And that happened uh, on the fly, automatically, no disruption to the uh, no, no disruption to the network. So it was. Uh, one of the benefits, I think, of having heavily uh, worked towards decentralized upgrades is that it not only does it make it, you know, better governance for how to uh, upgrade the chain, but also it's just more convenient. It's just like uh, once you've done 10 upgrades, it just becomes very uh, much, much easier to actually uh, manage them. In terms of uh, what's, what's happening, a lot of the uh, development uh, of the Tizzle Core protocol is focused on scaling at the moment. I think it's a big challenge, and it used to be that scaling was a research problem. You know, people, when I got interested into the topic back in 2017, there was just was no good scaling proposal. People were talking about sharding, and I couldn't read one coherent thing uh, around sharding that Ethereum wanted to do. It's just like none of it made any sense. At the time, my favorite uh, approach was something that is now called ZK Rollup. I wrote a blog post in 2017 called... Uh, why Tezos, uh, why I'm not pursuing uh, uh, sharding as a strategy for scaling Tezos, and I describe using recursive zero-knowledge proof as a way to scale. So that's what people do with uh, zero-knowledge uh, rollups now. I do believe there's uh, something even better right now than ZK rollup, which is optimistic rollups. So they're uh, a form of so-called layer two technology. They're not as cool from a tech standpoint as uh, ZK rollups, but I think in terms of safety, uh, speed and a lot of factors uh they tend to have the uh, they tend to have the upper hand so i really like this uh, i really like this approach and the nice thing with it is that it actually lets you scale so scaling has turned from a mostly of a uh, um research problem to an engineering problem and that's what i've been tackling with uh, with some engineers uh, to propose upgrades that are going to increase this, the throughput of tezos massively do those throughput increases in your mind come at upgrading the, the core base network or as a layer two more like Ethereum is um, uh, employing uh, kind of optimistic and zero knowledge rollups? Both actually. So there's two, there's two things you need to do to, um, to really scale. You need to scale your execution uh, and that's, you, get, you get that with optimistic rollups. And you also need to check, uh, scale your data availability, which you get by building a data availability layer. So that availability layer is something we're building for the Tezos protocol, and that one has to be part of the protocol. I know there's uh, people out there who's, who are proposing basically uh, data availability as a service in some sense, where you connect to another blockchain to get your data availability. The problem with that is you get only light client security proofs for your data availability. So I don't think it's as good as having it directly in the protocol. But even for rollups, in theory, you can build an optimistic rollup directly on... Uh, in a smart contract. You could just write a smart contract that does this, and this is what Optimism has done, this is what Arbitrum has done. 
what we're building is so-called edge shrine rollups for Tezos. So they're rollups which are built at the protocol level. So the protocol has native support for rollups. In theory, it shouldn't make a difference. In practice, it does. You can write more efficient code because it's not metered in the same way that smart contract call is. You have more flexibility. And it's also a guarantee because if you have rollups which are part of the protocol, it's also, um, I would say, uh, an informal guarantee that the security of the rollup is seen as as important as the security of the, uh, of the of the layer one. So they're not treated as a second class citizen. I'm interested in data availability as a concept because it's being talked about more and more. Could you define it for the listeners who may not be familiar and why it's important? It's probably the most elusive concept uh, you have when you look at the security of a chain. It's it's the hardest one to it's hard to grasp that it's, grasp that it's, that it's even a thing. The general idea is when you have a blockchain, people need to be able to validate it. And for that, they need to be able to download the content of the blockchain. That availability means the availability for a node connecting to the chain to have access to the data contained inside the chain. It sounds pretty straightforward, but at what, at what scale and at what level does this get extremely complicated without going too far down the technical rabbit hole. <laughs> That's a funny thing because when you think of scaling, you think of execution as a hard problem. It's like, oh, you're computing things. You know, that's, that's hard. But actually the hard part is just making the data available, which sounds much more straightforward. The way it gets tricky is when you have rollups. So a rollup essentially is a technique where someone is going to do all the computation. You don't force every node in a network to do all the computation. You just say, look, you don't. We're, the computation is going to happen, but someone will do it. You don't have to do it. In a ZK rollup scenario, someone does all of the computation, so they take the transactions on a chain. They're not executed by the validators. They're executed by a special node. And that node does all the computation, and then they provide a proof on a chain. They come in and they say, ah, here's a cryptographic proof that this is a correct result of that computation. And everyone validates that. And they say, oh yeah, that is a correct proof. Now that's what I proposed in 2017. Essentially, you outsource your computation. That works fairly well. In the case of an optimistic rollup, you don't provide a proof, but what you say is you give the outcome of the computation and then anyone can come in and prove that you're wrong. So instead of proving that you're correct, you have someone else prove that you're wrong. It's, it involves a, l- a little more machinery to do this. But the machinery is worth it because computing this cryptographic proof is extremely expensive and extremely computer uh, intensive. Whereas here, you only need to build a proof in the rare case where someone is trying to cheat. So that, that's a concept for a rollup. But if, some, if, if you want someone to come in and prove that something is wrong, they need to have access to the data. Even with a zero-knowledge rollup, if I, if I come in and I say, here's a proof that everything is correct, it's like, well, okay, maybe it's correct, but I don't know your inputs. So if I don't have your inputs... I can't do anything with it. I can't access, I, I can't access uh, the rollup anymore. So if you're going to outsource your computation, the inputs to the computation still need to be public. And that's what it means for them to be available. So now you're seeing a lot of zero knowledge layers scale, but they're not really scaling because they move the, they move the data availability to a centralized committee. So they'll say, oh, sure, we'll prove to you that everything is correct and everything is correct, but the data we're just going to like trust a small committee to actually make the data available, which is a trade-off in terms of security, but there's, there's a better way to do it. And a better way is to decentralize your data availability as well. So the naive model is that every node downloads everything, right? That's what blockchains do today. A more advanced mode is that instead of everyone downloading everything, everyone downloads a little bit of an error correcting code. And the beauty is that if you have more than 50% of that error, correct, error correcting code being downloaded, then you can reconstruct the entire thing. And that scales. So what this tells you is if, if you're a node and you have 10% of the stake or you're producing 10% of the blocks, then you will need only, you, you, what you need to download will be in proportion to how big you are. So the bigger stakers get more work to do, which is a nice property for decentralization. So what, what's the state of, of rollups on, on Tezos? So right now we have so-called uh, transaction optimistic rollups so built within the protocol. So there are rollups that can do uh, just transactions. They are here for two two scopes to put because simple transactions and simple transfer are still probably one of the biggest use cases on uh, on blockchains. We also have code for um, optimistic rollup for smart contracts, and we have code for zero knowledge rollup. The zero knowledge rollup code is still experimental; it runs on testnet. The smart contract optimistic rollup code is in the main chain, but it's not activated in the main chain; it's only activated on a uh, on a testnet. It's being uh, progressively released in the upcoming proposals. 
So maybe a, a slight transition. We've talked a lot about kind of the base layer, the, the Tezos protocol. What's happening on top of Tezos? How are people using the blockchain today? Probably our biggest source of growth over the past year has been uh, NFTs and specifically arts. A lot of digital art has been created on Tezos in platforms such as Hikentnunk, Teya, Object.com, FXH. Uh, those have become very, very big names uh, in uh, in digital art world, not just on Tezos, but um, everywhere. And um, it's not just that. We've also had some growth in gaming, some growth in DeFi. But by and large, the bulk of what is making Tezos application famous for today is really around digital art. We like to think of ourselves as Greenwich Village in the 1960s or Paris in the 1910s. It depends on your, your flavor. How do you manage kind of or measure the the growth of the chain and its usage. Um, what are some of the kind of metrics that you look like look at to say, oh, Tezos is being used more, or the, or the user growth is growing? One metric I, we really like to watch is uh, number of smart contract calls. Because if you're calling a smart contract, you know, you're not just like transferring tokens to an exchange or from an exchange, you're actually really interacting with the chain. You're doing something. And so uh, that's, one, uh, that's one metric of growth. You can look at uh, daily active uh, or monthly active addresses uh, on the chain. That's one uh, uh, one metric. Number of uh, number of, of application, number of companies launching projects. This type of uh, this type of metrics. Yeah, I think some of those some of those get a little bit muddied and they and they can be gamed. I think the the best testament that we had was um, uh, we had this website that was extremely popular, Hikiknunk, um, which is where people were posting a lot of digital art, so on and so forth. And the creator of of the website um, basically took it down. And I think within two hours, there was um, several mirror websites that were brought up. So I think, you know, there's, there, we've been through the space enough that we've, we've seen a few trends and like um, what was, what was a fad in 2017 when we, you know, kind of um, put our uh, heads out there and, and, and we really started to get more involved as a project that was known in the space um, is very different than what's popular right now. Um, but at the end of the day, like organic community, um, is something that's like really, really hard that people try to make a lot of approximations for, but really like the best testament is just like, if something goes down in the system, like how, how fast is your community to react? And, um, for a lot of, for a lot of the, um, projects that have, have really thrived in, in 20, the environment of like 2020, 2021, um, I don't think there's a lot of like organic community behind it. And that is, that is a massive strength that we've shown with, um, some of the some of the forums for uh, posting art specifically, but also gaming and a few other applications on Tezos. What do you think are some of the bigger catalysts that that's going to let's say drive the next you know wave of adoption on, on Tezos or maybe sort of smart contracting platforms uh, broadly? So my conjecture for like the last few years has been that gaming is really kind of the, the beachhead to get the industry more popular. Um, games are basically fully fledged digital economies in their own right often. And we talk a big game um, as an industry, cryptocurrency, um, cryptocurrencies do, um, about how we're going to reform capital markets in some form. And it's going to be better because it's going to have, you know, blockchain, 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 um, never using an article. But uh, but it's, it's <laughs> um, but also to say, like, I do think, you know, gaming is a good testing ground to see, like, if, act you know, this stuff actually holds to promise in um, an area where it's usually much lower stakes to, you know, obviously get the... Um, get the software running and and being as effective as it could be. So I think a lot of the games that have been successful so far in the space have been retreads of, of either Ponzi schemes or <laughs> um, very classic gaming uh, mechanisms. And I feel like we really haven't pushed the envelope all that much. But once we do, um, hopefully that'll that'll catalyze a whole new set of users. Because frankly, you know, one of the least popular games in the App Store is still going to have more users than most most cryptocurrencies do on a daily active user basis. It's incredible when you look at the number of users that chains have, even you know what is considered massive success, and you, and you compare that to um, to anything. I remember it was back a few years ago. It was a ten year anniversary of of, uh, of Bitcoin, and a journalist asked me, "It's like, oh, you know, what do you think of the growth of Bitcoin in that period?" And the the, the launch of Bitcoin coincides roughly with the launch of the Android operating system, and Android has reached billions and billions of users are using Android every single day. And when you compare that to the growth of cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies look so tiny. It's like a tiny fraction of the world use it, and they don't use it all that often. Of course, you know, apples and oranges, obviously. But it tells me that there's just so much 
room for adoption. I mean, it, it tells you it, it's two things. One is that there's no product market fit for uh, regular humans and crypto, or it tells you that there's so much room for adoption. I think the latter because we haven't, people have just still been playing around and we haven't seen some of the uh, some of the bigger, more serious use cases that that I think we can uh, we can develop on these platforms. Yeah, that's an interesting framing. I always go back and forth in in terms of thinking about how to actually measure adoption in crypto or Bitcoin because you can make the argument that like it doesn't necessarily scale with number of users. It actually just scales with dollar inflows or capital inflows. In which case, it's like. There, we, we have seen sort of tremendous growth over the last 10 years. But then the flip side to that is, well, what is the nature of that dollar inflow? Is it purely for speculative? Is it you have the VCs that are trying to pump and dump? Or is it kind of to, I'd say, kind of Kathleen's early report, potentially as just this insurance policy? A comparison that I made a few a, f- a while ago that I think is more apt as, a, as we kind of go through these different cycles Um you know, in the 19th century, the U.S. had a railroad boom and it was basically a very overcapitalized industry. And so you had like this wealth and this, you know, amount of money going towards these different, I guess, different railroad companies. But it was sort of impractically woven together, meaning, you know, even as late as the 1920s, if you wanted to go from Boston to Washington, D.C., you'd actually have to get off of the train and, um get get on a different uh, rail line in Philadelphia because they weren't connected and they weren't like interoperable with each other. So you'd think that that would be like one of the first things we'd align on is like standards of the rail or if you're creating a very well capitalized train network. Um, but actually, it was one of the last things that they, they figured out <laughs> um, because basically they were so flush with cash, right? And they were so busy like, carving out their little fiefdoms. So some very impractical things didn't get done because the, the, the industry was so funded. And um, there's a little bit of that going on. That's a great analogy. I, I, the, that, that, that kind of also is brought up when you kind of look at how the internet scales, where you had like, you know, TCP IP as just this standard protocol, but that just did, you know, a few things right. Uh, and then ultimately it scaled like via layered architecture. I'd be curious, you know, how you see the competitive dynamics evolving. Do you think that we're, we're more so like sort of converging towards maybe a few chains that are call it laying out the the groundwork for then applications to be built on top of do you th- see a need for interoperability um you know it, I, I would i would be curious independent of let's say the 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 funding how do you see similarities between the the, the railroads of the the 1900s and you know public blockchains today my other favorite point of comparison is in the 19th century, you had this concept of a booster. So someone who would go buy up a plot of land and say to everyone, uh, hey, you know, we're going to have the railroad coming to town. You better buy some land. By the way, I own most of it. And we're going to jack up the prices, so on and so forth. Because once the railroad comes, you're going to have all these industries around it. And the you know value of the real estate local to it is, is going to be much higher. Um, so this is called boosterism. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's parodied at length by um, a number of great American uh, novelists. And uh, I think that's been a lot of what's been going on the last few years. It's like we're going to have the best, you know, technology dot, dot, dot eventually. Um, and rather than actually like, you know, stress testing things by actually, you know, using using the network for something, for example, um, it's been a lot of like over promising and under delivering um, in terms of technical capability. The nice thing is at some point, you know, you did actually have to ship goods across country and you wound up using the railroads that were like reliable and good. <laughs> um, and so there's there is like a little bit of you know don't don't pay too much attention to the man behind the curtain there uh but it, it it's kind of like part of the process whenever you have an industry that's like super overcapitalized you're going to get these sort of promoters who are just really interested in the little pleafdom where they promise you the railroad's going to come and then there's going to be people who actually like forge the iron <laughs> and actually try to get you from point a to point b and i think that's that's I guess if I have a more succinct answer, it's um, the people who play the long game are pretty easy to tell in the long run. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably the the, the biggest challenge in this uh, in, in this space is um, the fact that so much of the adoption is specula- is like speculation of of adoption as opposed to actual adoption, means that it screws up a lot of incentives and it screws up a lot of signals because you you want to be building what users are actually needing and you can do doing this in the abstract without actually like having a lot of users using the thing can be difficult. 
I mean, it hasn't helped that like larger players in like sort of the quote unquote web two space have used this as like kind of a bargaining chip to like fundraise for themselves, right? So there's a lot of like paying for friends uh, in the industry just because it is so well capitalized and you can kind of extract rent from that. Again, without like delivering a functional product or like maybe even thinking through some of the architecture, like some of the more famous blunders um, over the last few years have been not follies of of the sort of base layer, but actually like the implementation uh, because people get sloppy. This kind of dynamic is inevitable with crypto assets because they're inherently financialized, that you're always going to have people moving in uh, that are trying to overfund and, and boost projects, maybe in a more speculative manner. Or is it these kind of deleveraging bear market times where that behavior gets weeded out? It does. But I also think, I don't, I don't think it's inevitable. I, I, I think the more actual adoption you have, the more that goes away, because it means there's something to compare to. Like you're not, there's a flu, there's a flow of information that's coming in, and as as long as this flow of information is coming in, you can have some you can you can have some sense and you can have some some things make sense. If you don't have any information, if you don't have any empirical data, then it's all narrative building, and it's just like narrative competing against narrative. And you could say the same thing about an interest rate environment, right? You have for you know decades like very low interest rate environment, you're missing a lot of really economic signal. Like if you can borrow and raise money indefinitely. It's really hard to basically say, like, am I, you know, am I building something worthwhile? Is anyone actually going to use this? And as soon as you have a little bit of signal filter in, it, it makes things a lot, uh, a lot healthier. So, what does Tezos' roadmap look like? Let's say the next year, the next uh, three, and then five years. Yeah. So Tezos doesn't have a roadmap because I, I like to say Tezos is a blockchain. It's not sentient. It can't have a roadmap. Well, you could talk about what you're working on. I have a roadmap. Yeah, exactly. No, but it's important. I mean, you know, it is it is what differentiates Tezos to uh, to a, to a lot of the projects. So I, I think it was, it was actually a trick question, Arthur. You 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 got you got it right. It was a trick question. Uh, and, and and you know, we have a uh, so there's a there's a protocol uh, upgrade called Kasmandu, which is activating in uh, in three days. We had an anonymous contributor in that protocol upgrade. Uh, someone who knows by goes by the name of uh, GB Fifi, who uh, made an uh, made an improvement and is being rewarded by uh, by the chain. So the chain is actually automatically going to pay a reward to the anonymous contributor, which added a feature to uh, to the protocol upgrade. And that was not in any roadmap. I think it's someone who was like, I really need that feature. I'm fed up that it's not existing on the chain. I'm going to write it and get paid for it. And they did. Uh, they did another one. So we didn't have for the longest time consensus key rotation. And it's a useful feature. People have been asking for it. I'm, I'm guilty of like not personally focusing on it because I'm really, really focused on trying to run a, 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 a on trying to run ahead in terms of scaling. But you know what? They implemented it, and now it's in the protocol. And uh, again, there's a uh, there's an invoice that goes with uh, with it. My personal roadmap. So what I like to see, um, essentially, there's a version of Tezos that I would build if I were to build one today, which is different from the uh, from the current one because you know hopefully with eight years of uh, eight years of hindsight I should be able to do a better job than I did uh, initially, and it's trying to move it uh, uh, progressively in this direction, but it's first gets uh, protocol enshrined optimistic rollups, so really really fast optimistic rollups running on the uh, uh, on the Tezos uh, on the Tezos blockchain data availability sampling. So uh, we're using a version which is similar to what's been proposed in, a, uh, in Ethereum using Kate commitments for, uh, uh, <clears throat> for um, sorry, using Kate commitments for uh, uh, error correcting codes. I prefer this version to the other version where you have an error correcting code and then you can send fraud proofs. It's better if it's not interactive and it's, it's, a, it's an easy scheme. So build these two things. Once we have massive throughput like this, Focus on latency, so try to uh, get the latency down to uh, to a few seconds. Uh, I think right now we're around 30 seconds. Uh, we could easily, with what we have, cut cut it down around probably 10 seconds. But if you want to go down to one or two seconds, there's some implementation work that needs to be done around the shell to be more a bit a bit more uh, a bit more efficient. It was built originally for having long block times, not very very short block times. So it's not that the consensus algorithm permits it, but a lot of the infrastructure and the peer to peer layer would come in the way if we try to do it tomorrow. And then once we have that, I think the the protocol is going to be in pretty good shape. After that, it's uh, it's really uh, paying down remaining technical debt, cleaning things up, but also 
when you get a roll-up, most people think of, uh, of it as a way to scale horizontally. It's like, oh, you have your chain, and then you can run a bunch of roll-ups in parallel, and you get scaling because your roll-ups are running in parallel. And it's certainly true that you can do that. What's less discussed is that roll-ups are a way of scaling vertically as well. If you want to scale by saying, I'm going to throw a huge machine at it, and we're going to have 100 gigs of RAM, and eight CPUs with 128 cores each, you know, something crazy like this, you don't want to run this at your base layer. You don't want to ask your validators to run this because it's very expensive and you want to have a wide, very wide set of, uh, of validators. However, if you're asking the roll-up node to run this, it's not that bad because for validators, you need to have 50% or, 30, or 66% honest majority. For roll-ups, you need a single person. You need a single honest party to actually be running the, the, the roll-up. So having larger computer computing requirement on roll-up make a lot of sense. Roll-ups also don't deal with a lot of issues around they don't have to deal with mempools, they don't have to deal with all of that. So I think some of the development stops being about the L1 itself, but about building very, very efficient roll-up nodes that can run high-performance roll-ups to run on, uh, on Tezos. I call it, uh, a bit jokingly, UHT for ultra-high throughput. But it's also a type of milk. <laughs> Which is popular in France. And uh well Arthur's busy doing all that stuff. Um I'm gonna be <laughs> I think I think basically we made a lot of inroads in the art world. Uh that was very much like reacting to what people were organically coming to. Um and basically just like, you know, bolstering things and like forging relationships with like key actors in whatever industry kind of like takes up takes this up next is, is kind of um, where I've, where I've um, at least done a good job and like want to continue to do a good job. Um, so um, Arthur sounds like he's got his, his plate full. That makes a lot of sense. It sounds like there's a lot of exciting stuff in the pipeline. One thing I want to touch on, because I think it's important to frame uh, all these, especially the technological side of improvements of scaling and, and data availability they're needed in context of blockchain scaling to massive levels. How do you view the regulatory environment uh, today and how it's evolving in the future and how that could affect the rate at which kind of smart contract networks are adopted, uh, either favorably or negatively? It's a good question. If you have a point of view. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's it, it's hard because I look at regulation because it, you know, it affects the entire industry, but I'm also not an expert in it. You know, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a policy expert. The one trend that worries me is that it used to be that regulation was very technologically neutral. So essentially, government was saying, look, if you're selling a piece of art, it doesn't matter if you sell it on a blockchain or if you sell it you know, to a person, you're going to follow the same regulation. If you sell a stock, it doesn't matter if the stock is on a blockchain or if the stock is on a stock exchange, you have a regulation to follow. And that's a, you know, you can debate about the regulation itself, but that's a sensible policy. And it's not a policy that kills innovation because you can actually, you know, um, you can still create all sorts of technology. It's not a technology itself which is being regulated. It's a usage of technology by various parties. And that's sensible. What we've seen uh, both in the European Union and in the United States is a push towards actually not being technologically neutral. If you look at the Infrastructure Act, for example, there's a provision for it uh, that requires a form of tax reporting uh, if you, in a course of business, receive more than $10,000 worth of a digital asset. And they define a digital asset as anything, any asset that's represented on a blockchain. And so reporting requirements that would not exist if you were to buy a painting, for example, will exist if that painting happens to be a digital piece on a, on a blockchain. And that's not technology neutral. That's penalizing. You know, a, a database will not have to follow that. A, a corporate database will not have to follow that regulation, but a blockchain will. So that's not neutral. And this is, I think, a, it, it's, a, it's a worrying trend. There's another uh, example in it in, uh, uh, in some European regulation, but I, uh, I, I can't recall it at the moment. To say anything, I would say probably pushing for political action is the right, is the right thing to do. I think there's a big consistency that wants this innovation to exist and to happen. And there's not a whole, there's not a big consistency against it. I mean, yes, there's some people who define themselves as being anti-crypto and they're very vocal, but it's just a few people. There's many more people who are pro and even more people who don't care, even many more who don't care. And so as a political issue, I think that it's not hard to win a few, uh, a few races and to meaningfully change the conversation. Uh, among regulators by changing the conversation first around policy makers. And yeah, like one of the reliefs was like, you know, the 
I guess, environmental impact of, of cryptocurrencies were becoming a massive catalyst that brought in people who were neutral to, you know, not, not interested at all, frankly, um, into being sort of radicalized against it. So it's a relief that, you know, Ethereum did, did finally change to proof of stake because that, that really, um, took some of the mainstream bogeyman out of, out of a lot of, um, you know, people's, people's minds. So that hopefully, um, helps settle a conversation that I think radicalized a lot of folks who otherwise would be maybe even allies. Like the thing is like, if you read, you know, the origin stories of a lot of these cryptocurrencies or cryptocurrency as a movement, it's like, it's radically egalitarian um, in a lot of meaningful ways. And so it it shouldn't be such a hard sell (laughs) uh, to people that it's a good force for good. But um, I think a lot of, a lot of the conversation is just going to be muddied by um, mostly the environmental impact over the last few years. Uh, So that's, that's been uh, tough to watch. Awesome. Some wise takes. Um, I know we're up on time. It's been awesome having you guys on the podcast. Uh, Arthur and Kathleen, thank you so much. Thank Thank you. you for having us. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.